this is a great volunteer role. <laughs> Help out with MLS as a scribe. Anybody? Very variable the number of people that show up here based on uh, what else it's against. Um, please make sure to scan the QR code. That's how we're going to make sure that we manage the queue and get people in and out to talk that are here on remote. It also helps us for uh, um, getting the right sized room. So if like 10 more people show up, this place is going to be full. Um, so please make sure to scan it so that we get the right size room for next time because that's how we do meeting attendance as well. Plan B, I can take notes. All right, cool. Uh, email? Give it like two more minutes. We, um, we have two hours allocated and we'll probably be done a little early, so we're not in a burning rush to get going. So a couple more minutes. doesn't work that. All right, let's do it. Um, hey, welcome to uh, ITF 118. If you're here just for this, uh, welcome to the messaging layer security meeting. It's a uh, Wednesday. Um, I'm Sean. I'm Nick. Um, so this is the note well. Um, if it's Wednesday and you've been around, you've probably seen it. If not, here's the summer high level summary. This is kind of the process and procedure stuff for how we run working groups, uh, especially with respect to IPR. If you know something, you got to say something. That's how it works. Um, there's also like any harassment policies, code of conduct, et cetera. If you have questions about anything, ask the chairs. We have other friends that can help as well. And there's some note really well that these are virtual meetings and basically doing professional collaboration. So try to treat everybody with respect. Um, here's some meeting tips. Uh, again, like I said, please make sure to log into the tool so that we can manage the queue virtually and remotely. Clearly, we're going to need a bigger room for next time. We're getting to standing room only in remote land. So this is great. Um, some more resources, the general agenda, meet echo information, other stuff. And here's our agenda. Um, we're going to do some rechartering discussions uh, first after we do the administrivia. Um, then we're going to talk about the working group IDs. Um, and then we have some individual IDs. And uh, for others that are on the, that see the topics up there, like Britta, He's probably staring at the like, what the heck are you doing, Sean? Or if we have some time at the end and you have anything you want to say about something that we talked about last time, you can feel free to get up or not. So it's just kind of a placeholder for things we talked about last time that there was interest. Um, uh, is, is there anybody that wants to uh, bash on this agenda? Going once, going twice, sold. So all right, so this is where we're going to have some fun. I'm going to share my screen. Because one of the things that we've been pinned on is uh, actually doing um, charter revision. Because we asked our area director what they thought about us just adopting a bunch of extensions now that we're done with version 1.0 of the protocol. And he said, you don't have to do a heavy lift, lift of the, the um, charter, but you do need to update it to like accurately reflect the fact that you've actually published a, a ver version 1 of the protocol and you want to work on this. So I took a stab at this and we are going to try to do this in real time uh, and see what people think about these words um i know that this is probably going to be overly painful but one of the reasons why i want to do this is because then i can send it immediately when we're done that we've got like some general feeling for this so basically what i tried to do was just change the uh, hold on you're not seeing it because i'm not sharing it yet share screen accept yes i would like to do this 
this one. Allow. Great, and now you're seeing it. So before it was this kind of like, hey, you know, we're gonna do this. Well, we did it. So my theory was that we'd essentially start, change the intro to say like, you know, we, we published a protocol and here's the RFC number, and here's what it actually specifies. So to make it kind of more of affirmative of what we actually did. Um, and so I kind of blew away some of the background like for like the motivations for doing it because we already did it. We don't really need to do all that. Um, and then I kind of changed the, the text a little bit where I, I uh, summarized. Let me give you a second to read this before I just blow through. Can, you, can people see that? Take a second to read it to see if there's any like glaring objections. All right, go once, go on twice. All right, um, and then I add some more stuff down here about you know why we developed it. We did this. And you could argue we could get more of the background, but I thought, man, yeah, whatever, we'll just leave it. Right? And then this is the tense change where while we did this, we specified these things. And instead of it being aspirational, we kind of actually did it, which is nice. Going once, I'm not seeing any like, what are you doing, Sean? All right. And then at the end, this is kind of where I punted and just said, we're going to do some extension work. Now, I don't know what the ISG is going to say, but I, I have this fear that we have a lot of extensions, right? And I don't know how it's all going to go. So I want to like maybe not give a list um, because I think that that's better, but I don't know whether the ISG is going to be st a stickler about, hey, you need to give us some kind of sense of, is this two or 30? Right now we're kind of in the middle. So um, we'll, we'll see how this goes. And uh, I guess the only other question I might have for you know, people that are doing the development is, when do you think might be a good time to give a date for when we will be done with our first set of extensions? Does anybody have any feeling for when that might be? Like in six months, in a year, aspirational? Ecker. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I wasn't. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, this seems like TLS and other product, other working groups have been doing this for forever. So, like, surely there's just some charter text. We can just copy and paste from there. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of the 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 the, the, the text that I changed was the way I did it. But they basically just said maintenance of extensions. My concern, obviously, is the ISG finds new windmills del tilt when there are new new members, and they have, apparently have some new things that they'd like to tilt at. And so I'm just not sure what that is. And it might be that we have to give them a list. So. Well, I'm not in the ISG, but I'm going to tilt this windmill. Okay. This has been an anti-pattern in TLS and in SIP and like basically every other working group we do this, where there's like, you get the main thing that's important. And then like, there's a rush of like, frankly, kind of irrelevant stuff that like nobody knows how to object to. So like, actually we shouldn't do this. You should actually name the extensions and you should recharter for new ones. Not just be like, we're going to take everything. And like, as soon as the queue and the queue drains, we're going to take more stuff. So no, like not the ISG, but this is a bad plan. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, was, I guess, uh, sure. I'll try again. Um, because like what happens is that like, the highest priority stuff gets done first. And then like, is it attractive nuisance and more and more like dumb stuff it gets into the queue. And eventually you're just like, I mean, I'm sorry, but it's just true. Yeah. And so like, yeah, um, I'm sure like all these sessions people are right now are awesome, but in six months, they may not be. Fair enough. That's a good point. Uh, Daniel Clark Gilmore, I, I got to say uh, a similar thing to Ecker, but maybe not exactly the same. I don't think you should list specifically the extensions. Uh, that you plan on working on, uh, but I do think you should try to list some criteria about what you think makes a good extension. Now, maybe that means it's an example list, yeah, say, yeah. you know, including like these things, but you should say like, what what kinds of things are you looking for? Are they authentication things? Are they uh, usability concerns? Are you going to say, we're only looking at things that have a, a deployment story? Uh, are you looking at ways to upgrade things? Are you, you know, the only thing you have here is Cypher Suites. It's yeah. the only concrete Right. Thing. So, so give, give a rubric for what makes an extension that's worthwhile. Okay, that is great input. 
And as usual, PRs are accepted on this particular uh, pull request. Um, Jonathan. So maybe an overly literal reading of what's written here would say that the extensions do not need a thorough security analysis. It says we did a thorough security analysis, now we're going to do extensions. So maybe just say, and, and we're still going to do security analysis. Yep, OK, good point. Mr. Barnes. Classic media echo mute delay. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, Ecker and DKG here. Um, I, I think the good thing here is we already have a bunch of stuff queued up. So that um, gives us, we can kind of look at that and figure out how to draw the lines around it. I will try and send some uh, PR on this. Awesome. And again, there's a GitHub repo where I dumped the, this, uh, where I dumped the charter text and it, uh, revision. So feel free to get in there and add your favorite extension and we can have debates about it. Frankly, we always knew this was gonna happen because we had an extensions document and the, dis the, the discussion has been like, well, what goes in this one and what goes elsewhere? So now we're just kind of like having that decision, a discussion about that decision. So that's good. Um, but I would like to try to figure out if we can time bound this. So I would like to try to get this kind of settled by like December because there are extensions that we have uh, a lot of support for that are kind of waiting in the wings. Um, and so I would like to get a move on and get that done so we can try to actually get the extension framework document out the door. So thanks. Uh, anybody else in the queue? All right. And again, it's github.com slash MLS working group um, to find it. And then you can find the working group materials page and then the working group charter. All right, we'll stop with that. Um, now we're going to give a quick update, I think, Benjamin, on the architecture draft. And we don't have any slides prepared, unless you want to look at the GitHub repo. OK. Actually, there is not much to say on the architecture documents. It's mostly um, done right now. Ecker opened a few PRs uh, recently that I need to review, but mostly editorial stuff. I don't see anything controversial in, in the things that I've reviewed. So basically, it's a last, last, last call on if you want something in, if you think there is something that should be in the architecture document, you should raise your hands and, and tell us now. Otherwise, it's mostly going to be an editorial pass and, uh, and will be done. Yep. Awesome. We were always there, but we are not boy. <laughs> I largely agree with what Benjamin just said. And by the way, thanks for bearing with me as I sort of went through this. Um, I did find a number of recommendations which I thought were perhaps just a little more optimistic about like, the reality <laughs> than reality. Um, you know, to give an example, like, you know, you should start like keep your security, your, your signing keys like in an HSM. I mean, people do that sometimes, but like I bet like most implementations don't. So like, I think I filed a bunch of issues for these and I'll let the chairs manage it anyway, please. But we should probably um, go through these and make sure that like, you know, there's nothing we're, like, like we should like just close, just close them one way or the other. Um, isn't there one, um, I think there's one thing we should discuss here, which is um, this issue 210, which is about um, the recommendation that the group operation should be encrypted. Um, and mm -hmm. um, so, um, like, I don't feel strong with this from a technical perspective, but like Mimi is like definitely not encrypting them. And so the IT actually have a consistent position on this topic. Mimi is not encrypting group operations, as I understand it. Uh, Did I misunderstand that? Yes. Mimi is going to encrypt group operations. But we'll discuss this specifically. Okay, so, so oh, you mean later in this day? Tomorrow. Later. Tomorrow. No, okay. Like both, both tomorrow and today. Okay, okay. So my point is merely that we should harmonize Mimi and MLS one way or the other. So um, if, if we're going to resolve the meme, then I'm fine. So I kind of have an opinion on the general remarks that you made on, on the recommendations. I think most of them could, should just be attenuated into notes or something like this instead of ju just recommendation. Sort of makes it clear. Like what I wanted is to have the information that, okay. you know, you should, if you can, if you have the ability, you should put do those keys into secure hardware or whatever mechanism that you think is uh, is safe, is more secure than just like putting it in software. But maybe you're, you're right, we should attenuate some of the recommendation as notes or something. So maybe, I'm oh, sorry. No, this is what the time is for. Right. That, that's that's right. No, I just thought we kept it coming. That sounds fine. I guess what I would suggest is 
like um, <clears throat> which Benjamin Benjamin like works with some PRs, but anybody who, I would suggest that anybody who like felt strongly at the recommendation should go look through that list of issues. Mm -hmm. If there's one that you think we should not attenuate, like please let us know so we don't attenuate it. Um, um, because like you know, otherwise we'll, we'll, just, we'll just go ahead. Just to confirm, Sean, there is no more that the you know this, like. There is no RFC language for in the architecture doc like this. This there is no must. There is no should. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, uh... you can do should with lowercase, and they're supposed to figure it out. And then as we go through the process, people will will, will ask you, should it be po should it be capitalized? And we'll just say no. So recommendations are really can. In, yeah. in the, yes, uh, in the whatever the joke RFC that Richard the wrote, yeah. and occur, I guess too. So yeah. Yeah, Steve. Oh, that's right. I remember Steve was on there. So basically, there's these 22 open issues that you're talking about, Ecker. Well, but half of those are discussed issues. I think we actually yeah. Issues to close yeah. Through. Like, um, actually, the the area directors' reviews are mostly done. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they should, should be done. It's just like before closing them, I want to have the full pass on the the full editorial pass on the document. It's two twenty eight, two nine, basically. Like, be, don't leave Okay. Awesome. That's what I'm hoping for. Um, sure. So great. Good. So you can see, get in there, mix it up. If you're trying to figure out how to contribute in the IETF, this is one way to do it. Um, get to the repo and read stuff and comment on it. So, so, oh, I think we are trying to push it by the end, before the end of the year, right? So yeah. like, if you want something, like just... Yeah, no. If you want something, it's best to provide text. Um, so let's yes, just say that. Definitely. Yeah, cool. All right, great. Yeah, that's cool. All right, I'll stop sharing. Now we're going to try to go and switch to extensions. And it's still not there. What a pain in the butt. All right, I have a backup plan. We'll go back here. All right, Rafael? Um, I'm going to be running the slides, so let me know when you want to go to the next slide, okay? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so um, this is actually just a continuation from the MLS extensions document that we talked about in San Francisco. So I'm Rafael. And so in the past months, we've been working uh, on what we call safe extensions as a concept along with Conrad, Joel, and uh, Marta. Next slide, please. So just a little recap what happened in the document. Um, in San Francisco, we proposed the last resort key package extension. Then uh, Rowan proposed the self-remove proposal uh, as a separate draft initially, and that made it into the document now. The safe extensions API, which we're going to talk about in a minute and then also new IANA registry entries for the use by extensions. Next slide, please. So to recap, um, for those who weren't there, what the last resort key, pack key package extension does, um, it's literally just a marker for key packages. Um, so it became common practice with uh, messengers that use the signal protocol or similar protocols to have last resort um, pre-keys in that case, and the equivalent of pre-keys in MLS are key packages. And so the idea of a last resort key package is that it is a key package where the, the private key that corresponds to that is not deleted immediately and can be reused uh, multiple times, simply because clients don't always have the capacity to generate so many key packages ahead of time that they will never be depleted. So when it comes down to the last one or a small set of last ones, you can call those last resort key packages and, and use them multiple times. And the idea here is simply to mark these key packages uh, with that extension that doesn't have any further payload. Um, and the benefit of that is that everybody knows that it is a last resort key package, meaning the server is not going to delete it as it might be doing um, otherwise. As soon as a client has fetched it, And uh, on the other hand, it's also signed, so we get authentication on that. And it's also transparent to other members of the group that that is a last resort key package. And uh, potentially, if there's some policy around that, um, that could then be enforced. Sorry. 
trying to do too many things, uploading slides. Trying to remember what's on the next slide, but I yeah. don't. Apologies, <laughs> failing miserably. Let's do this one. Right. Yeah. So yeah, that was it for uh, the last resort key package extension. Self-remove proposal run. Already presented that last time in detail. Um, so this is just a little recap. Uh, what it does the Fundamentally, it addresses a problem that when you allow external commits, um, it can be a conflict when members try to leave the group because they cannot commit to um, their own um, leaving the group, essentially. Uh, they can only do a proposal, and that proposal cannot really be honored in an external commit. So this extension essentially remediates that problem. Next slide, please. Right, so I will briefly talk about the threat model or the problem statement of the safe extensions, and then Conrad is going to present the details. Um, so uh, this is not the usual threat model in the sense that it's not the usual attacker, um, but I thought the name was still fitting here. So what, what problem are we trying to solve? Um, we have different actors. So we have the MLS protocol spec authors. Um, and typically, they would also do the MLS implementations. Then we have authors of MLS extensions, as we see now. Those are not necessarily the same ones as the protocol spec authors. And then we also have application developers who want to use MLS in an application. Um, and so <clears throat> they might be interested in more than one extension. And these extensions might come from different extension authors. And now the, the first question is, um, of course, will these extensions themselves going to, are they going to weaken the security guarantees we get from MLS? It, it, might, it might be the case that the extension authors are not you know, knowledgeable about every aspect of the MLS protocol and you know, might, might have done something that, that weakens security guarantees. So that, that's one, one of the issues. And the other thing is that, um, the extension authors might not know each other and they might have designed the extensions at very different times. And then these two extensions, let's call them A and B here, they're fundamentally not really compatible with each other because they invalidate something uh, from the other extension. And so the, the problem is really um, for the MLS implementer, for the application developer to understand uh, what can I use actually, what's compatible and, and what do I need to be wary of in terms of security? So, yeah, that's a, the threat model here is actually, uh, well, the attacker is MLS extension authors, more or less, uh, not necessarily malicious ones, obviously. So, yeah, I think, Conrad, then you can talk about the details. All right. Um, right. So the safe extensions API is essentially just an interface for an extension that's developed by an extension developer to interface with um, the main MLS protocol. And um, yeah, we just for convenience we call an extension that only ex uh, interacts with MLS through this API a safe extension. And as Raphael alluded to, so the the goal of a of the API is that safe extensions don't break the security guarantees that the application otherwise gets from MLS. And uh, also that uh, multiple safe extensions interact with MLS in such a way that they don't break the security guarantees of other safe extensions. Um, right, and so if, if you want to take a look at an example, I'm not gonna go through it here, but the targeted messages extension, uh, we've changed in the extension document to use the safe API. Uh, if you yeah, want to let, take a look at an example. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Right, so concretely, the safe API is, is relatively simple. It allows uh, extensions to use any public key material uh, from, from, the, uh, from the MLS group state. Um, so in particular, you can do HP, HPKE operations. You can do, the extensions can do signatures. Uh, they can export secrets, and they can inject PSKs. And 
it's um, kind of made safe by the API ensuring that all the operations that are done by different extensions are kind of the main separate by the extension ID. And that's really all there is uh, to it in this context. Um, what we haven't done yet and what we uh, want to do next is also include interactions with the actual kind of extension data. So if you think of a group context extension, so kind of an extension that has data in the main kind of group state, um, then right now there is only one proposal called the group context extension proposal that can just essentially write to the whole state, um, like write the whole, um, the, the state of all group context extensions. So if one extension wants to change its state, it's going to have one uh, uh, group context extension proposal and then could also change the state of another extension in this context. Um, and our goal is to kind of allow more fine grade control through proposals uh, that each extension uh, can then uh, define. And then each proposal can only change the data of the specific extension that it defines, kind of get some sort of access control on the state and the group context uh, extension. Um, and then thinking a bit further, this might actually remove the need for a group context extension proposal entirely because each extension can manage its own state kind of um, in a more fine-grained way rather than you know just writing to the whole state of the group context extensions. And I think that was it. Um, Okay, so I have a naive question, just to jump the gun here. Um, I'm a spec writer. I'm not writing any code. How do I, the first thing that I'm going to ask is, how do I get my extension to get past this? Are you basically saying that when we assign the identifier for the extension, that's the thing that's used to say whether or not it gets processed? Or like, we'll, would be able to flow through this API to work? So the idea is, if you have such an extension ID, um, then you can look at the API and it provides a number of functions. And every time you have to plug in your ID, and as long as you do that, you're fine. But you get an ID through writing an RF, through writing an internet draft and going through the process and going. So we're essentially using an IANA marker, right? Is the way I put it as a way to get in or out. So it's a little bit like it's more than it's like a recommended flag kind of in the TLS sense, right? Yeah, I mean, you can but also maybe do a proprietary thing if yeah. you don't want to. Yeah, if you don't care. Okay. Yeah. I just I just wanted to make sure I understood that there wasn't some like, you know, my extension is being thrown into some formal proof and then out comes pops no, magic. There's no, no black okay. magic. All right, cool. I just wanted no to make way. sure there wasn't something I completely didn't understand. <laughs> I wish, right. I wish. Yeah, okay, but, fair enough, know. right. So I should be thinking of this as sort of like TLS Explorer labels where there's key separation based on the label? Yeah, pretty much. And this is just key separation or, uh, you know, uh, domain separation or generally by the ID of your extension. Thanks. Um, I'm just a little bit, this is Daniel Conn Gilmore. I'm a little bit confused uh, at the first bullet point on this slide here, where it says public key material from the main protocol, HPKE and signatures. Um, are you saying they can encrypt and validate, but it cannot decrypt or sign? Um, what, I'm just trying to align, because I thought you said that it could make signatures, which would not be public. Good, key good point. So the, 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 the bullet is, is incomplete. They can also sign and, okay. and, and decrypt, yeah. Okay. So secret key material as well as public key. Yes. Okay. The secret key material presumably is domain separated, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah, um, so they don't get direct access to the key material, but they have an API through which they can do signatures and decryptions and stuff, yeah. Is there something special we need to think about because this is a group agreement that the extension is in use, or is that just sort of all given to us by MLS? Mm, um, Rafa? So, I mean, <clears throat> the safe extensions are work like any other extension. It needs to be advertised in the key package that it's supported by all clients. Um, so in that sense, it's no different. Is that your question? So, yeah, so, so you have agreement from MLS that it exists and that everyone agrees on what it is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to, to go back to Sean's question, the, the process is the same as with any other extension. The only difference is that if that particular extension claims to be a safe extension, then it needs more scrutiny, essentially, to make sure that it does use the API as intended. So not remembering all the text, 
when we set up the range of extension points, there's going to be some part that is like first come first serve. And there's going to be some part that's going to be designated expert. And there's going to be some part that's going to be come back to the working group. Right. So that's where you, you'll get the review. So you'll force people to come back. Yeah. I mean, this should go back to the, the working group yeah, okay, and, or right. designated experts. Okay. So. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll find a better way, but I guess the, the point is if you're going to get this marker, you're coming back to the working, you have to go through the working group process to get through the pro through the door. Okay. Is that something that should be in the draft actually? Yeah. There's, there's the Niana consideration where we'll eventually get to that point where we put the text in and it says how okay. you, how you get a code point inside. But we don't have to do it right here in the safe extensions. Not today, but okay. no, we'll, we'll have to do it at some point in the internet draft that defines safe extensions. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, Rowan May. I just wanted to add um, that in the in the draft, but not mentioned on the slides, is that there are three different kind of variations of sort of styles of uh, proposals, and there's also credential types of, available as extensions. I, I think that's on the next slide. Could you go to the next slide? I think that's somewhere in the slides. <laughs> Find the right thing. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah so. Thanks, Rohan. That, that's the kind of the next thing. <laughs> it's, it's a good segue. Thank you. Uh, it's not exactly the safe API, but uh, what we also added to the extension document is essentially. Um, so right now, if, if, if you, as an extension developer, you want to use your own credential, you want to use your own proposal or, uh, you know, another wire format, you have to not only register your extension, but you also have to register uh, an IANA entry for whatever proposal you want to define, et cetera. And the idea here is that there is a thing called an extension proposal, extension credential, extension wire format um, that has a, a field called extension ID and then just a content, opaque content data field. And so if you have an extension, you want to use a proposal, you can just use the extension proposal and then slot in your extension ID and whatever data you want in the proposal. Of course, you have to define the semantics for the proposal, but you don't have to register the proposal as part of the IANA. Uh, you don't have to go through this IANA process. And um, yeah, just to make it a bit, it's, it's, it's nothing to do with safety or anything. It's just making it a bit easier on uh, extension developers to use proposals, use credentials, et cetera. OK. Stefan? Hi, yeah, this is Stefan Fries. Uh, I've got a question to slide number seven. Uh, there was one question to that, that one already. Uh, so you mentioned public keys and access to public keys via the API. So you said that the access to those keys would be done via the, the API. And you also mentioned uh, secrets, but the second point reads export secrets. So that means that uh, the corresponding private key would be able, uh, could be exported or, or which, which type of secrets are you referring to here? I think this refers to the exporter functionality of MLS. So that you okay. can export secrets uh, through the exporter, not okay. not the secret key material you use for HPKE. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. That makes it clear. Yeah. So I wanted to quickly mention something that that I think might be important in the future about the safe extensions API, especially in the context of platforms that are going to possibly implement this um, across, you know, all the way the web platform and, and others. Um, to be very careful about, like, we won't have the ability to extend the APIs for arbitrary extensions, right? Mm -hmm. so there are a set of extensions that we'll be able to handle through the native APIs, and there are a bunch of extensions that, that would require new functions that some platform would be able to implement and some platforms won't be able to implement. So especially, I think, like, OSs have more flexibility than the web platform for this. Um, but I wanted to mention that, and we should be very careful about that. Um, yeah. I, I think um, it, it works in the sense, or it, it's conducive to what you're trying to achieve in the sense that, as Conrad just explained, rather than registering individually extensions for credentials and proposals, et cetera, at the IANA level, the only thing you register here is the ID of the safe extension, and then you reuse what's already there. So um, to me, that sounds like it would be a lot simpler to support that uh, in browsers specifically. Yeah. Thanks. All right, so we did 
that one. And then the next slide. So yeah, I'll talk about the, the next steps, but maybe also to uh, answer a question that Ron just uh, brought up in the chat earlier. So this is not, um, you know, a get out of jail free card for security analysis. It's it's like it's very well determined what you get from it, but it's you can still come up with a safe extension that does something completely stupid, and not secure at all, um, and so yeah. You still, you still need a security analysis. Um, so yeah, what are the next steps? Um, kind of already said what's going to happen for safe extensions, like better separation and address feedback uh, as well. So um, as we were designing them, there was some initial feedback where we saw that it didn't work uh, the way it was supposed to. And so we expect maybe to get some more feedback or run into more problems um, as folks start to Look at safe extensions and uh, or actually um, author some of them um, and more generally regarding extensions uh, in san francisco we had a, a long list so i want to go back to that again so this is also now interesting in the context of sure. what exactly are we going to do yeah um, there are two of them or three of them that are essentially in the works uh, and ron i think is going to talk about the mimi related extensions in a bit uh, anyway, so uh, the obvious dependency here is MIMI. Um, there's not so much that can be done in the MLS working group about that. The other two, um, I want to go over really quickly. Uh, user trees, you've probably never heard that particular term, but it is something that we had in the protocol spec at a very early stage. Um, and that was the concept, I think it even came from the, the ART uh, proposal before we had TreeCam where you could, uh, in a multi-device scenario where users have more than one device, you could actually sort of hide that from the rest of the group. And the leaves that are typically clients in MLS would essentially be uh, or represent a user. And then users had a little subtree with all of the devices in it, but that subtree is not really visible to the rest of the larger group. And the like conceptually, the root of that subtree then becomes the leaf of the supergroup. Um, and so we didn't keep that in the protocol spec because um, not all aspects were entirely clear. It was slightly more complicated than what we have now. So I think we got rid of it simply to simplify stuff and it wasn't clear whether people actually wanted to implement that, etc. cetera. Um, however, we took a look at it again and it does solve a number of problems in some uh, deployment scenarios. Uh, one huge advantage is that it's most likely going to be much more efficient than what we have now uh, for two reasons. A, um, the groups are smaller simply because you don't have the devices at the leaf level anymore. You only have users. Um, and secondly, there will be fewer blanks because on average, um, there will be more updates per leaf in a supergroup, simply because it's not just one client per leaf doing an update. It can be multiple clients that can do an update for the same leaf. So um, if updates happen more frequently, you have less blanks in a tree. Um, so obviously the gain here is less payload and less compute. And now Richard, is your question regarding that particular bit? And I can take it now. I, I was going to make a slightly meta point as we are working on uh, updating the charter to have some scoping of what's in and what's out. We should maybe uh, be a little bit careful about not throwing everything in the universe into this document. Okay. So <clears throat> long story short, um, this is being worked on. Um, and the other thing that has been around for a while really is deniability. And so we had two sort of competing concepts there, um, one that was rather minimal, that would only uh, give you deniability for application messages, more or less, and the other one being more comprehensive, however, being not very efficient. Now, if we had this user tree extension, um, then those efficiency concerns would be a lot smaller. So um, yeah, this sort of motivated us to uh, work on that again. 
then yeah, hopefully in the next months uh, we can present something on that. The other extensions, uh, encrypted group context extensions, were things that were ideas that were floated at some point. Um, I suppose quantum optimized mode, application messages from external senders, etc. To my knowledge, that's not being worked on actively. Um, and yeah, but I included them on the list because we had them previously. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, to Richard's point a little bit, uh, you know, the, the list we're probably gonna, if they're not actively being used and we're updating the charter, we'll probably not include them. <laughs> and so that would mean we'd have to recharter. Maybe that will be the impetus to get people to write something really quick. But since it's about the same six people that are doing most of this stuff, I don't know what their workload is like. So I think we should just be realistic and to know that the, you know, the world's not ending if it's not in the base, in the, in the base document, we can always update it. But I guess one of the bigger questions we have is, um, there are some Mimi related extensions. Are those extensions coming here or are we going to let Mimi do their own de extension definition? I'm looking at the chair sh of Mimi. One of them is shaking her head like, hell no, we're not doing it. Or so, <laughs> Rowan. Uh, I was going to address that in my. Okay. All right. Cool. Slides, all right. So. Good. So, yeah. All right. We're thinking along the same lines. All right. So, thank you. Thank you. That's it. All right. Great. We'll go to the next set of slides. I have uploaded these. Uh, they were sent mid. That was why I had one of the problems, but they're up now. Hi, I'm Rowan. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so there is one. There was one issue that I created um, on the self remove proposals in the MLS extensions document, which is that, as written, self remove still doesn't allow a user to do an atomic remove of all of the user's clients. So, what can the user do right now? So. Um, <clears throat> Option one, uh, a user's client that wants to leave a group, it could send a single commit with remove proposals for all of its other clients so that it can, it can definitely commit that and ensure that they're gone. And then it can send a self-remove proposal and well, it should be gone the next time some, anyone does a commit. Uh, but that leaves this awkward period of time where the user has one client, but not all of its clients in, in the group. Um, the second option is a user could go ahead and send uh, a stack of remove proposals for all of its other clients and a self-remove proposal for itself um, and just kind of cross its fingers and uh, hope that an external com commit doesn't arrive because if an external commit arrives, then the self-remove proposal will be incorporated, but the remove proposals cannot be incorporated the way the spec is written right now. Um, so what's, what, what, are, what could we do if we want to solve this problem? So uh, option A is we could, we could add to the self-remove proposal. So we have a list of leaf indexes, for example, that you, that you can remove if they correspond to uh, other clients of the same user. So they would have to have the same, you know, you would have to have some way of verifying that their credential corresponds to the same user. Uh, and option B is we could change the behavior of an external commit in the presence of self-remove to violate the, you know, to contradict what it says in the spec, which we're allowed to do in extensions. It's just that then this is no longer a safe extension. Um, so uh, if anyone has any immediate feelings about this, feel free to speak up, uh, but uh, also feel free to just comment on the GitHub issue uh, on the extensions draft. Uh, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. This is a problem that we should, we should address. Um, I'm not sure about option A, adding new indices, then kind of we introduced this kind of notion of a user or associated clients to MLS. I'm sure if we want that, maybe as part of Mimi, where the notion of user exists. Um, uh, I do like option option B. Um, so yeah, I think ideally with an extension, we should probably soften this kind of restriction on the external commits. Um, I think the only thing with the external commit, the removes should be fine, 
but we just have to be careful that the external committer is still able to somewhat, you know, um, verify the, the verify the proposals. Uh, and in this case, it should be fine because you know it's modifying the group state and can see the group state. But yeah, it, it shouldn't be. We shouldn't be too liberal with the the external commits. Yeah. Yeah, just for the sake of completeness. So it's not like I'm strictly against that, um, but it does open up more problems potentially. So what you can still do today is that, uh, I think in your example, Alice removes all of her devices first in a commit, immediately sends the self-remove proposal, you know, bundled with that commit to the DS that is not going to separate them and either like reject both or accept both. So in that sense, from Alice's perspective, uh, it's still a one-shot operation in that sense. And you could do that as it stands today, so. Okay, yeah, I, 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 could, I can write some additional comments about this stapling option in the, uh, in the issue, and let's just see what everybody says. All right, discussion broke out, awesome. All right, Jonathan, sorry. We've got a scrum at the mic. I know. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a, I haven't read your draft. I'm sorry. Um, is this mooted by user trees? Like, does user trees just solve this by the fact that everyone's just hidden behind one identity? Uh, yeah, but we're a little far away from that practically. I mean, maybe in a year we'll have user trees. Okay. So I'm just trying to think about the application context in which this lives as opposed to the cryptographic context, which is to say the benefit of removing yourself from the group is other people, not you. Um, that is, I don't get any particular benefit from removing myself from the group. Um, uh, but uh, um, you know, if I don't want to get the messages, I just tell the application to send them to me or I ignore them. Um, and so like, this all seems fine, but I guess in an application, it seems like what you actually want is other people to throw you out rather than rather than uh, rather than you to remove yourself because you can't be counted on to do that. No, it's that you want when when someone else looks at the roster, if they see that you're still in the group, <coughs> that that when that they have the expectation that they're going to send a message and it's going to arrive at all your devices, uh, well, and if you're not, and if the, you don't appear in the list, that it's not going to arrive at any of your devices. Well, I think this, but I think this goes back to the conversation where we haven't had a Mimi about the about, yeah. about the, about the application of the roster, the MLS roster, like. <laughs> Like, I mean, I guess, again, like, it just seems like that, you know, like the, the two generals problem here, which is like, I've got to send this and I got to sure it gets processed and et cetera, et cetera. But from the perspective of everybody else, like the thing I want is like, I'm out of the group and then, and now that's see me like in the little thing, right? And that does not depend on this stuff. That depends on something else. I, it, it's correct that I can go and ignore the messages on my side. So for on my client, I can make my client ignore messages that I receive after I've decided to leave. No, no. I mean, I tell the application, I tell the, I tell the DS not to send them. Sorry. I tell mean, the I DS tell not. The, I mean, I tell the DS not to forward them. I mean, like, for, like, like, like think about like what happens in a non-encrypted system, right? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, the, and that also, and that also, you know, the, but you asked the question and I said, it's for everybody else. And so for everybody else, the idea is that if they, you know, that the intention is in whatever kind of system this is, that all of these clients are disappear from the list that everybody else sees atomically. So when, when somebody else looks at their, at their notion of the ratchet tree, they see all of the, all of these clients disappear together or not at all. But, I, I, but this is like what I'm pushing on is like that, that is that like the notion that like they look at the ratchet tree, I think is incoherent. Well, the, yeah. I mean, uh, the way that it's presented to the to the user in most of these systems is you see a roster. No, but, I, I, but I, my, and, my point is that what causes, yeah, I understand what you're saying. And what I'm saying is, is that when I send the message to the, on the application level to evict me from the, for, to evict me from the group, that should, try, that should cause the roster to empty me out, regardless of what happens to the ratchet tree. And the ratchet tree seems to backward, back, backwards. And the idea that I've like said, the idea that like I've said evict me from the group and like I neglected to send this or the data message got dropped, that I should start with the roster is wrong. Okay. <laughs> um, so I guess so, I'm challenging the use case, not like the, not the right. Okay. So that is, I think that's more appropriate for discussion in Mimi. Sure. But, you know, definitely like, but, I mean, but we should put a link to that discussion in this issue. And, 
maybe that issue will resolve in a way that requires us to do no work here. Okay. Uh, this is Daniel Con Gilmore. So uh, I feel like I continue to beat the drum that uh, individual users, separate clients, showing up as separate clients but being tied to the same user has problems. It has metadata leakage problems. Uh, this is yet another problem with it. Echo what you're describing in terms of what the user experience is: is that oh well, the person is just not shown in the roster if you know if they've removed one of their clients is. Well, but, but the point here is that th this removal will not be atomic, so maybe one of the clients won't be removed. As long as the other folks are still encrypting to that key, that's a ghost user, which uh, we do not want to, to create. So, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> these are more problems that are chasing down this issue of exposing the fact that there's, an, you know, that there's multiple clients per user to the other clients in the group. So, you know, we, we continue to pay the cost for having made that decision um, of, of exposing it. And I, 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 what, what do you propose that we, what, well, what do it, you think is the long-term solution? Like just forget I mean, it about sounds like, like user whether trees, we do this Sounds like not, user but, trees might be the long-term solution. I mean, yeah, yeah, okay. I, I mean, I think we agree that user trees is an excellent solution to this abstraction problem. Uh, do we want to do something else in the meantime? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, I, I wrote a short draft, um, and this was, this occurred, uh, you know, just kind of as extensions was being updated with the self-remove API. And uh, basically this is a proposed extension that would restrict the use of a key package to a specific context. So what do we mean? I mean that the issuer of the key package wants to be able to communicate, I issued this key package and I only want Joel to use it, or I only want it to be used for this specific MLS group that somebody invited me to. Um, and I think that that's gonna be kind of broadly interesting and useful. Um, and I just kind of threw a couple of ideas as uh, you know, here are some of the things that you could do with this. Uh, you could use it only to join a specific MLS group. Uh, you could say that it's only meant to be used by a specific adder uh, that has a following user identity or something like that, a credential, uh, that you can only use it if the adder is in a specific domain or if it's, they only, have, only if they have a specific public key. Um, so, I'd, I think this is useful. I'd kind of like to add this into the extensions document. Is there any strong feeling on this one way or the other? Uh, can you maybe give an example of where you would use this and what the benefit would be? Yeah, I, so I want to issue a key package that allow that allows the um, that it's associated only with a specific uh, MLS group. So uh, if I hand this, you know, if you, if uh, if Conrad, if you ask me for a key package, I can say here's a key package, and I'm only going to I'm only going to respond if I get a welcome that's for this particular room. I'm going to process it, and otherwise, if you send it to to your spammy Bitcoin group. I'm going to uh, I'm going to you know immediately leave the group and throw it away and ignore all of the message messages. Go ahead. Rio um, Kazuara, uh, uh, I, 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 from my understanding, this is uh, this proposal is supposed to be a, a access control mechanism. Is that correct? Uh, it's a way for so that the access control mechanism exists with the. The client who issued the yeah. key packages. Yeah. Okay. It's a way of communicating the, the intention of yeah. the of the client that generated the key package. Okay, so uh, if uh, if like the, this is an extension, so if like the a certain like MLS implementation does not support this extension, like uh, is it like is it uh, uh, is that implementation like able to like uh, like ignore what it ignore the specific context and like context and like. Uh, 
use it in a use the key package in a uh, wrong way. Uh, it's up to the client who generates the key package whether they list this extension as uh, a required capability. I believe. So if I could I could issue the key package extension without the require without it listed as a required capability, and then if you didn't understand it, you could ignore it, or I could list it as a required capability, in which case you would see the required capability and then following the base spec, okay. you would say, I don't know how to process this key package. Okay, uh, so oh yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll like uh, continue to like uh, uh, read the document and like uh, if there's any, uh, any anything like I can't like answer right now, like uh, or like ask right now, I'll, I'll, I'll ask in the mailing list. Thank you. Thanks. Richard? Thanks. Yeah, so I, I actually skimmed this just this document just now as I was trying to figure out what charter detect, what scope to put in the, in the new charter. But um, one thing that was unclear to me looking at the document was what your enforcement model is supposed to be. It seems like if you wanted uh, a key package to be only usable with a specific group, you, you would want the, the members of the group to enforce that an ad with a non-matching key package is invalid. Um, so is that what you had in mind? And so I think we probably need some text in the document to elaborate that. Yeah, I was thinking that the um, that the generator of the key package, the client which generates the key package, would be, you know, basically primarily responsible for enforce for enforcing this. But uh, what you're just what you're describing is that a commit arrives, which doesn't uh, which which conflicts with the the desired usage. And everybody else w would see that as valid unless we wrote some language that said everybody else has to has to say no that that this ad is invalid. Is that what you're? So you're uh, saying, saying if, if I you're saying that if I publish a key package that says please add me to this nice polite group, and instead you get uh, that gets used to add me to a spammy Bitcoin group, that'll all work, but. Uh, it's this is a flag to my client to to recognize that I have been not at, I, I wasn't supposed to be added to this group and so that I can then just like automatically leave or something. Yeah, I, I think in this case, I don't think it's really necessary to do this for everybody else because if I do get the if I do get a welcome with this key package uh, private key, then I'm just going to go and remove myself and so it doesn't it doesn't really affect the other the other the other clients really need to take no action in my opinion uh, that that seems like a lot slower and more complicated and more error prone uh, at least for the cases like you know where you know the group id and you can do just do an exact match and go ahead and enforce and the enforcement is simple like it seems like it would be a lot simpler and more effective to just be proactive like that again for for sure. those cases where the criteria are clear yeah okay great Raphael. I just want to state that this is uh, generally a useful mechanism in my mind uh, and to offer a more concrete example in addition to yours. Uh, we also discussed that in Mimi. Um, so MLS allows you to add someone to a group as long as you can get your hands on a key package. Uh, that's what the protocol does. That's not how most messengers work. Um, so in order to address spam, for example, it might be really useful to you know, have a mechanism where other, even other clients can see that that person should not have been added to the group. And one way of doing that is to mark key packages where, uh, for example, you have two kinds. One kind is to only create one-to-one -one connections uh, between two users. And the other kind is for actual groups, like actual group chats. And so, uh, you know, a commit that covers an ad with the wrong type of key package would be rejected not only by the DS, but also by all of the clients. So that would make that mechanism a lot more robust. Okay. Conrad? Okay, I just wanted to get go kind of back to the, I think the first comment with regard to the access control. So the, the required extensions, um, um, extension is it required an extension? capabilities? Sure. Re required capabilities. Thank you. That's a group level thing. So you cannot put a, something in a key package that says I require the group to 
support these extensions. So just kind of to highlight as a, as a limitation of this thing, it won't work in groups that don't actually have this extension in them. Because if I read the spec correctly, you can have a key package in a group that has extensions in them, uh, in it that, that are not known to the group that are not, you know, supported it, by the clients in the group. Right. It won't work for other clients to do something in the group. I can still act on that on my own client when I receive a welcome. If you support the extension, yeah. I mean, but, I generated the key package, so obviously I support no, but, the but I mean, if, if someone would, would the, the scenario that Rafael just sketched where someone would take that key package and put it into another group, but that group doesn't have, like, doesn't support this extension, it won't do anything. Just, it's for, not, for the other users in that. For the other users for in the, the group. For the existing members of that group. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Britta Hale. So first of all, I can see a lot of value in the sort of access control features of this. I'll add a caveat though, that this does mean leakage of a lot of metadata. So basically anyone who can see my key packages can get information about my intended use of MLS and where I want to be added or not added and so on. So although there can certainly be use cases for this extension, I would say it should be done with a so warning label that that needs to be mm -hmm. taken into account. Okay, I can I can add that. Thank you. All right, I, I All right. next slide, now. please. All right, cool. Let me go. All right, cool. Okay, so this one is about extensions for Mimi. So this is sort of a heads up. Mimi is planning to have some it is planning some stuff that would pro that is likely to require some extensions and i'm going to sort of sketch the current thought about that and so my understanding of the charter is that mimi is not allowed to to create mls extensions but it can reference them did i get that right Melissa? okay so um how did you guys manage to get that to happen so we have to do your work <laughs> <laughs> Enough work to do. <laughs> uh, so um, currently, the 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 proposal that that was that came out of the design team is that there's this notion of uh, of uh, room state, which consists of both room pol room policy, which changes relatively infrequently, like that may never change for the lifetime of a room. Like, uh, this is a members only room and you need to be an admin to add and remove users. That's an example of a room policy. Um, and then you have a participation list, which lists the users who are actually uh, participants in the room and what their roles are. Uh, and so the, the sort of straw person plan we have is um, that if you want to make a change to the room policy document, that that is sufficiently a big deal that using a group context extensions proposal, which requires an update path, is that's a perfectly fine, you know, infrequent enough action that causing an update path is not is not a problem and life is good. But if you're just making changes to the participation list, particularly if you're adding users to the participation list, we don't want to require an update path every time that, that occurs. And so having a, um, and also we, this, um, this is information that the intermediaries uh, want to be able to act on because they may have access control to allow messages to flow or not flow based on this information. And so, uh, sending this as a new proposal type, which does not require an update path, that says this is a modification of the participation list. So in this case, um, add, you know, add Bob as a participant to this room. Um, so this is kind of what we're, um, what the current thinking is. Please go and look at this, the specific idea in Mimi, please comment on it in Mimi. But the idea will be that kind of once we come up with, this is what, what we would like to do, then these proposals are gonna have to, they're gonna have to be incorporated here in MLS. Um, and I'm just gonna point out that uh, the way that we've kind of formulated this now, the participation list proposal um, that 
this, it looks like it would be a reasonable safe extension. Um, the one caveat there is that um, we have both, we're sort of treating both the room policy and the participation list as part of the same uh, room state and the same group context extension that is only being somewhat modified. So the, basically the way that group context extensions works right now, the, the group context extension proposal only modifying a single, you know, sort of a doing a bulk modify of all of the group context extensions. That's not really what we want in Mimi nor really anywhere else in MLS. So, but kind of a, you know, a, another reason why we need to fix this problem in MLS. So okay. now that Eckers left the room, I can ask this question. So <laughs> just totally kidding. Um, his proposal for the charter changes was to be very explicit and recharter every time you need a new extension. This looks like a get out of jail free card for you guys for every every month to come up with a new extension and come to us. Are we going to be forced to recharter every time? Like, is there uh, is there some point in which we know that the no, extension is going to need me? Is like, I'm not okay, Richard. Me. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I think that the sensible bounding box we can draw is whatever Mimi needs, and then we can trust the sensible Mimi chairs. Uh, to keep that uh, within reasonable bounds and so not let everything in. So that would be my my bit anyway. Or you buy me beer and it works out. So you know, yeah. <laughs> that's a lot okay. of trust. All right, thank you, dude. <laughs> okay. No, note yeah. that I said Mimi chair is not Rowan. <laughs> Next slide, please. All right. Okay. Um, this is more update than two more slides and then I'm done. Um, so last time I proposed this new Cypher Suite based on the existing uh, hybrid chem um, that is already got, uh, is already in the HPKE chem registry, IN registry. Um, and so NIST announced recently, the, the, they announced that there is now the ML chem FIPS three, FIPS something standard um, that uh, is this um, post quantum, believed to be post quantum safe cipher suite based on uh, based on the Kyber algorithm, um, and it has some minor changes from Kyber. Um, now, um, I have not had a chance to go and review these. I understand that some of these were already anticipated in the uh, in the implementation because the authors already had the heads up from NIST about what the changes were going to be and already incorporated them in, in some stuff. So um, we need to ref make the appropriate references to the appropriate other documents that define the, HPK the HPKE chem. Um, and we want to reference it with the correct name. Uh, but at that point, um, I would be very interested in calling for adoption and asking the working group to accept this as a working group item. Yeah. So just to recap, right, we already, we did talk about this draft last time and there was definitely broad support for it. And so when we actually get to the part where we were, we're allowed to accept extensions, it, this will be part of the, the onslaught of messages to the mailing list about this. And then you can change all the, you can feel free to change the name in the actual text of the document, but you can actually, actually you can get rid of Kyber in the actual draft name that you submit and call it M on camera, whatever you want to do with yeah. it. But, uh, that's kind of the plan. So, yeah. And and to be clear, this is just this is only that this is not like the solution to post quantum. This yeah. is a solution yes. to the harvest now decrypt later, or a, a solution to harvest now decrypt later. There are other s solutions which are much more efficient, that are more complicated, that are have already been discussed by various members of the working group. And you know, stay tuned. Yes. Yes, Benjamin. Quickly, this is a cipher suit, not an extension, right? Correct. Essentially, okay. yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so that seems pretty inconsequential. The question I, I should ask right now is like, I mean, we don't. Like, the current assumption is that signatures are less problematic in the sense that you know, at the time of the compromise, you actually authenticated the message uh, with an algorithm that was safe, more or less. Uh, <laughs> but that sort of works, right? Like, how do you see we should? Or do you think we should start looking at signatures in general? Because the intuition is that signatures will require much more 
changes to the protocol, then I feel like that's a CFRG question yeah, that, written that's... all over it. <laughs> well, I, think, I don't yeah. actually think it's a CFRG question. Okay. Like, you assume you have a signature uh, mechanism that is PQ. Like, how does it affect the protocol? Um, it does affect the protocol quite a lot, right? I think before it affects the protocol, it will affect the credentials because the credentials can be longer lived than the. I mean, in any case, the, the credentials will certainly be affected. But so the question is more like, when is a good idea to stop looking at it? No. No? Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> for, we, can, for, yeah. <laughs> we, can, we can stop looking at it then. All right. Joel? Um, I was, so this is Joel Allen. Um, so uh, I think the CFRG might be working on their own version, a standard of Kyber. And I think there might be, end up with some deltas to the NIST one. Maybe, maybe not, but either way, it seems like maybe that is a blocker for a final adoption for that. Do you, have you thought about that or? Yeah, so I mean, this is based on the Westerbahn HP key reg, uh, registered uh, chem. And so I will, I will continue to, you know, I, I reached out to him uh, at last ITF and had a long discussion about this. And uh, so I'm going to follow whatever, whatever they're doing. Uh, okay. But I think that, that draft is also still in progress. And I think, right. Yeah. Well, so I, that's, Joel, that's I, I, I believe the, I believe the CFRG one is intended as an interim step while the NIST one is being finalized and published. So they should, in the long run, end up at the same point. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, but I know that the implementation already incorporates the changes that are in our Okay, cool. Uh, the other thing about the signatures, I just wanted to say this, the state of standardizing PQ signatures, I think is lags quite a bit behind where we are with CHEMS. So that's just inherently gonna take a bit more time. Uh, Britta Hale. So first of all, naturally, there's going to be a multi-phase approach with PQ transition as yeah. everyone here yes. <laughs> nicely yes. giggles. Uh, I don't think that needs to hold up this draft. Uh, so there's going to likely be several extensions that do different things with post-quantum. Some it's just the chem, some might be other chem combinations, some might in start including the signatures. We can have those extensions and with the probably will need a guidance document also at some point that have, tells us how to piece all these together for different applications or what your trade-offs are. Uh, but that doesn't need to hold us up because we do have applications that probably should start using it. John? Yeah, John Gray from Interest. So this is a hybrid construction, right? So it's Kyber and X25519. Yeah, it's a concatenation. So yeah, it's a concatenation. So in the LAMPS working group, we have a composite chem which is very similar, but it uses a, there's a combiner. We also have a composite signature. So if you come to LAMPS today, you can hear about those things. So that is work that's being done in that group as well. So I guess, you know, there's all these kind of overlapping things being worked on in different working groups. So I, I guess we don't want, people, how many flavors of, of hybrids do we need? Like I, we so in, should eventually decide on one. There's a presentation in PCRIP. I've the slides are already up yeah. that, it describes all of this work that's being done on hybrid uh, yes. chems being done in different working groups, including the exactly. including the chem that this one is based on. Yeah. And it shows all of the constructions and what they and how they work and what their their equivalence is. I'm happy to send you a, a link, put a link in the chat. But if you can go to PQIP. I yes, would, I will. My, this, I think this is the appropriate I, place I to have that actually discussion. on those slides with my colleague who's presenting that. So just okay. pointing that out. Okay, anyway, thank you. Right. Deirdre? Hi, Deirdre Connolly. Um, the updated ML Chem draft differs from the original for all the three drafts of Kyber that were submitted, and it's no longer committing to the key, the public key. And I think it's no longer committing to the ciphertext. This may be okay for MLS as it uses HPKE. I don't know, but I want to flag that because it's already biting other areas where things were drafted against Kyber, which did commit to the key, and the new thing, which doesn't, but everything is based around the indistinguishability chosen ciphertext attack 
security of the chem because that's the only thing anyone's been proving or caring about. But then they stop committing to the key and then you realize that you have like chem uh, decapsulation attacks, blah, blah, blah. So I want to flag that to make sure that everyone who knows about these kind of security properties of these nested protocols are aware that the thing they're about to switch to is different and has slightly different properties, even though no one is actually proving those things in a security game, because that's not what people have been caring about for these chems. So. Okay, see you in Pequot. <laughs> you will. <laughs> First intuition on that is that um, I think what could happen here is that we might be able to dust the group if we don't uh, key commit in the HPK thing. It's like basically you, you get the content of the chem that you send to the other subgroup <laughs> is different. So basically you make a fragmentation of the group. So you, you would, I think would be able to, to like fragment the group. So it's a dust, not, not more than that, I think, from the first approach uh, thought. Uh, which is a problem that we already have in, in, in MLS currently. No, well, I mean, at, like the good properties is that like you know everyone who is in the group, so at least you know who are sending to. And, um, but I think yeah, at all times you know who you who you are sending to. Okay, so uh, Jonathan, no, that's a Benjamin, if you guys maybe want to have a short discussion, send a message on the on the Zulip, or come to the mic a little bit later with your some with your conclusion. Well, I know, but that's a good point, uh, Deirdre. Okay. Jo Joel? Um, I just want to add, I think the way we're going to end up using this cipher suite is in uh, HPKE, and HPKE then ends up hashing in public key and ciphertext via the context. So actually for HPKE, I'm not sure it is as much of a concern, but definitely I I'd want to look at it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last slide, please. All right. Let me make sure I'm in the right window. There we go. All right. Okay. Um, so I had done a draft on uh, group trust anchors. Um, I am planning to abandon this. If there's anyone who who was really looking forward to this draft, uh, please come talk to me later. But um, basically found another way to do this with stuff that already exists. So. And so since it's a draft, it will just time out in six months and it'll be in the data tracker if you ever want to find it in the, in the future, but it's just going to go away. So thanks for the heads up. So I know not to push on you. That's it for me. Thank you. Um, okay. So now we're in collection time here. Share Sorry, the slides. Yeah. Again, it's still with me. Just wanted to quickly say, uh, if you found a different solution for whatever your problem you were trying to solve, maybe add a note there so that other people will know that they don't need this draft anymore. They could do X for whatever your problem is. So we're, we're kind of down into the end, ending times here. Um, I already talked to Richard. He said he didn't have anything to talk about last night. Richard, is that still true? Yes, I, I have not touched the additional credentials draft. Um, because it's already perfect as it stands. Um, and because uh, we didn't get the charter update done, so it's what uh, didn't make sense to call for adoption. This, this, is, this is where Richard nicely doesn't kick me um, and Nick about getting the charter done. So again, if people really care about uh, extensions work, please focus on the charter. Um, we can get that done. Uh, Britta, I don't know if you want to say anything about guardianship. What we talked about last time, like two seconds of like, hey, the paper's going to be done in three months or... I'm totally putting you on the spot, so Thanks apologies. For that. <laughs> uh, yes, a draft will be out in a few months. <laughs> oh, awesome. Cool. All right, great. Good stuff. Um, if you're curious about what that's about, you can go back and look at the slides from last time, uh, the meeting that we had in wherever we were. <coughs> San Francisco, right. Uh, Benjamin. Just before concluding, I wanted to um, tell everyone that like platforms are looking at uh, MLS APIs for the web platform on different OSs. So if you have use cases for it, uh, shoot me an email so that we make sure that at least, you know, that large fraction of the, of the users will, will get their use cases covered by the, by the APIs that we, we are looking at.
And it's Benjamin Berdouche, and he's on the MLS Architecture Draft and others. I believe you're on all of them at this point, or many of them. So if you need his email address, you can either grab him now or find it on the draft. And unless anybody wants to add anything else, we are concluding this session. A little early, but, you know, a lot of times we're rushed. This time will be a relaxed morning. Go have second breakfasts. Uh, you know, feel free to hit the coffee line early. Um, thank you very much. Oh, and thanks to Nick for uh, typing madly away there. <laughs> yeah, next time we're going to force somebody else to do it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I might have missed one or two things. Yeah, that's fine. But, um, you don't like reviewing the notes. Yeah, I really. Yeah. But I mean, like, so the best part about the notes is if you're in the ballpark, uh, yeah. you know, I'm not trying to verbatim. Them. All right, cool. <laughs> Next time I will not forget my laptop in my room. Uh, <laughs> Add only papers. Yeah. All right, so it looks like extensions are in there. Yep. Um, I do think it'll be interesting to see how the